Why do your grants not get funded? Why? You submit them, they come back, and they've been rejected for some stupid reason. For about the last 25 years, I've sat on grant panels all over the world. The UK, the US, Austria, Australia, Belgium, France. And there are some common things that people do that really bury their grants. So in this video, I'm going to take you through five of those things that I think you should really have a good long think about. And these are agnostic about the actual content of the proposed research. This is about how you write the proposal and it doesn't get funded because you've made this fatal error that just really annoys the reviewers and the panel. So the first one is burying your problem. I call it burying your problem. That is to say that you've taken the problem because you should actually be writing a grant proposal about a problem. But if you take that problem and you bury in page three or page four or I'm reading for 15, 20 minutes and I still don't know what problem you're addressing because you're giving me background and introduction and you're telling me what great work you've done and so on. And I still don't know what the problem is. And if I don't know what the problem is, then after a few minutes, I'm thinking you're not that focused on the problem. You are not that interested in it. And that's going to kill your grants. That's something that I look for. It just gives a bad impression. So the solution to this Put the problem on the first page, in the first paragraph, in the third sentence. What is the problem? You can write something like, you know, global politics is important, specifically this issue in global politics, and the problem this grant is going to address, here it is. Third line, tell me the problem. At that point then, I'm ready to read the rest of the grant. But if you're just giving me background on global politics and background on who you are and background on this and that, by the time we get to the problem, I'm already thinking this person isn't serious. This person is not focused on a problem, and so I'm not all that interested in what they've written. Okay, that sounds very, very harsh, but remember, I've got 10 or 15 of these to read through. All these other people are focused on their problem. It's the first thing they're going to tell me about. But if you bury the problem in page 3 or 4 or even page 2, I think that's a very, very bad mistake. Now, the next problem is finance. Should I ask for a tiny amount of finance? I keep my proposal as inexpensive as possible. No, no, absolutely not. You ask for exactly the right amount. So when I go through the finance part of a grant proposal and I see you've asked for too much and you can't justify it, you've asked for postdoc salary for something and you haven't described what that something is. You've asked for money for a collaborator and there's no idea what that collaborator is going to do. Then you've asked for too much and you're putting things in that you haven't justified. Asking for too little, that's just as bad. Because I'm not going to believe that you can do this amazingly ambitious piece of work if you haven't asked for enough resources for it, or at least you haven't explained to me how the resources match the ambition for the project. So that's point number two, the finance. Make sure that you get the finance just right. Not too much, not too little, just right. The next one is this. I read the grant, I put it down, and I think, where will this area of research be in five years' time if we award this money? If I can't answer that question immediately after reading your proposal, then for me, that's a no. If you can't tell me what the impact would be, not the outcome. The outcomes would be things like published papers or a published book or something like this. That's fine. That's okay. You're probably going to put that in. But the impact in five years' time, why will this area of research be different as a consequence of getting this kind of money? If you can't say it's going to be different, if you can't describe to me the impact this is going to have, then, you know, somebody else is going to do that in their proposal. So, you know, the person that describes the impact, that's the person that's going to do really, really well. So by not making that clear, you're giving me a problem with your proposal. Make sure the impact, not just the outcomes and the outputs, but the impact of the work. Make sure that's clear to me. The next one is, have you checked your proposal for dependencies? So if you've got three work packages, and that's a very, very common structure to see in grant proposals, but if you've got three work packages, WP1, WP2, and WP3, and work packages two and three really depend on work package one to work, well then, what if the first work package doesn't work. 
you've got to have a fallback position. So for every piece of work, you've got to convince me that it will work and that it will lead on to the next thing and it will lead on to the next thing. Even if you've been asked to write a proposal that's entirely blue sky, fundamental, pioneering, frontier pushing, whatever phrases they're using, they've still got to be able to explain to me how you're going to use approaches that will produce something, that you're not just going on some fishing expedition and if you come back with no fish, then what do we do? You've got to convince us of dependencies and that those dependencies can be met. So be very careful of that. Look at your proposal at the end and see, have I included something here where this later piece of work really depends on an earlier piece to work? And if that doesn't happen, how do I assure the grant panel that we have some fallback position in some way of doing it? So leaving that kind of thing out can really kill a grant. I'm quite sure I don't need to tell you about this, but typographical errors, spelling errors, I've seen sentences that end halfway through the sentence. They don't end. They don't finish. This in a submitted grant proposal, you might be shocked at how often this kind of thing creeps in. And I appreciate what actually happens. You're chopping and changing and you're moving things around and trying to get it perfect and trying to get it perfect. And in the end, you submitted without really getting somebody to do that last bit of proofreading. Because remember, the person that can't really proofread their own work is you. You can't really do that. You probably need somebody else to have a quick look over it just to make sure it's consistent, it's free of spelling mistakes, it's grammatically correct and really, really good, and that you don't have strange things in there like hanging sentences and so on. It's just a matter of housekeeping, but you might be surprised and how often people don't do this. Okay, I'm hoping that that's been useful to you. Very, very short video. As I say, if you could like and subscribe to this channel, that would be really, really good. And just up here is another video that I hope you might find interesting. Thank you.